Hi, I'm Mark Castell, founder of AEI Speakers Bureau, and welcome to the fourth installment of the Education Avengers Champions of Virtual Learning. We're very excited about this program today. And I might also mention that if you're interested in bringing any of our Education Avengers to your school district, virtually or in person, contact the agency. If you decide to bring them in virtually, we've engaged a team of producers to help you work with the Zoom platform to make the program seamless and more importantly, successful. Our first Education Avenger has written several books designed for teachers specifically on English language learners. Her topic is Mind Brain Education Science. Please welcome Joe Guzman. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Guzman. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar. I am delighted, delighted to partner with AEI Speakers Bureau. And today I get to share with you mind brain education science frameworks, processes, strategies. And I'm also going to share some very basic, simple things that you can do while you're teaching your students. And it could be from a distance, it could be brick and mortar, or whatever we're going to be doing, a combination of things. So let's go ahead and start out with this. I have a question for you. What did you bring me today? Well, one of the things I wanna bring you is I want to welcome you, but I also want to bring you some visuals. So everyone say a prayer to the technology fairy because I'm going to now bring in some slides for you. So here we go. All right. And, ah, gracias a Dios, it's working, yay. So today, Mind Brain Education Science, culturally and linguistically responsive frameworks, processes, and strategies for you. Now, have you had days like this? And I showed it in my invitation that it seems like daily as we were trying to teach children, adults, whoever it is that you were teaching, after this pandemic closed down many of our schools, we were trying to learn so much so quickly. And people would say, oh, here, you need to implement this now. Okay, so I've got that. And then someone would say, oh, but the standards, we're falling behind and we need to, okay. And I was just trying to hang on to everything. Well, you know, our brain wants to create meaning. It's always wanting to create meaning and it's looking for patterns. So we need something where we can organize everything and say, oh, well, I think that can go in here. Hmm, that can go in here. And I'm gonna put it in my new organizer here. And now it makes sense. So what is the first thing I want you to do? I want you to go ahead and stand up. So everyone stand up. And why are we gonna stand up? Because see this circle right here? Yeah, this circle represents a cell. And you know what, any time that we're active, that we have our kids doing hands-on and movement and language is connecting to that movement, then all of this learning goes into our cells. Be it that we're moving, there's a visual response, something. And you know what? that creates something called cellular memory in our body, our mind, our soul, everything. So everyone stand up. So to organize, oh, I don't think you're standing up yet. So come on, stand up. All right, so here we go. So there's three ways that we can organize everything from now into the new school year, everything that we need to do. So the first one is mind. So let's look at all of the neuropsychology research. Let's see how it can guide us to understand the emotions, everything that's going on with us. Uh, can I label the behaviors as an adult and a child? Number two, brain, the neurosciences. What do we know in the neurosciences that can help us in this thing called teaching and learning? And the last one over here, education science. Are there some strategies, processes that we can revisit and say, oh my gosh, that's why it works. So let's go ahead with the first one. The oldest pattern in our human brain is, well, it goes with this idea. The big question we should ask each other every day, if you're teaching children or adults, 
is, what did you bring me today? What did you bring me today? What do you mean, Miss Joe? And my adult students, superintendents, principals, directors, my student teachers, kiddos in the classroom where I'm working with teachers, what did you bring me today? Well, you all brought me this. Everyone who walks through our classroom door, and it can be this way, this is the classroom door, Yep, but this time it's from a distance. It's through a Zoom meeting. Sometimes we're at school and there's our classroom door, but everyone who walks through our door comes in with a story. Our job as educators is to learn and appreciate every person's story. So I bet you have all sorts of stories about what's been going on in your family. All of us do. Some days we have great successes. Yay, we scored some toilet paper, yay. Other days it's, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? I have 12 godchildren and, oh my gosh, I have baptismal godchildren and first communion godchildren and they're calling in and they're asking about this and what about our jobs and they have children and, and then getting calls from teachers and student teachers and, and superintendents that I've served in their districts calling and let's brainstorm, let's solution seek. We all have stories right now. So the first key point about our brain is, and our mind, is that the oldest pattern for teaching and learning in our brain, story patterns. So the best thing that we can do is to take a concept, a standard, whatever it is that we're teaching, and contextualize it with a story, a story that I understand that is culturally responsive, that I understand this story. Wow, well, if you were doing that for me as a child, that would have helped if you had stories about farm working families. My parents are from Mexico. My father was a farm worker. If you would have talked about the fields and all that, oh, I'm in, Miss Joe. And who'd have thunk? You were teaching me percentages. Wow. So contextualize the story. So the brain, the oldest pattern for teaching and learning, story patterns. The brain will always remember the story and then it remembers the concept that was embedded in the story. So let's try something else. Let's go to that mind research. We're gonna look at trusted models that have really stood the test of time. But isn't it interesting that some of these have come forth and said, you might wanna revisit me again. I can help you during these trying times. I can help your families, their children, everyone on your staff, your superintendent, central office, everyone, your beautification staff, which are your plant managers, your custodians, everyone, your community partners. So let's revisit some of these. And for many of you, some of these might be new. So number one, Joel Barker, a classic big key point. He wrote a book called Discovering the Future, The Business of Paradigms. Why are we feeling so ha huh, as teachers? Because you know what happened? We had no time to prepare for all this. And so, you know what? We entered into a new paradigm. And that means that, you know what? We all went back to zero. We could have been a 10, a 10 as classroom teachers. And then I don't know what to do with a Zoom. I don't know what to do with this Google Classroom and all the apps that they're telling me. And now bring this in and this in. And, uh. So let's celebrate, we're all at zero. What does that mean? It's just like when our phone asks for an update or a computer, it's time to reboot and transform and that's what we can do. The next one is I'm angry. This isn't happening, no, I'm depressed. All I wanna do is sleep. Oh, you know what? This is the way that it is. So the grief cycle. And the third one, and uh, in all honor of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on the grief cycle. The next one, change is external, transition is internal. Take a look at the book Transitions by Dr. William Bridges, where he says that, you know, change is external. We have no, no control over this, but transition is internal, how we respond to the change. So social emotional learning, trauma-based education, community building practices and models. These are the things that we need to help us move through this transition because endings trigger beginnings and beginnings trigger endings. But in the middle, there's something called the neutral zone where we just want time out, time to cocoon. 
But if you're finding yourself cleaning out drawers and closets in home and garage or wherever it is that you're teaching, guess what? That's a sign that we're moving to beginnings because we're trying to clear out the old so that the new can come. So now we go to the brain. Five big guiding principles in MBE education, mind brain education, science. All brains are unique, but number two, I really want you to look at this one. All brains are not equal because context and access influence our learning. What we've learned is that a lot of our children, they don't have uh, access to many of the materials, to the technologies. So with many of uh, my community, that uh, they said, no, no tengo el computer, no tengo el Zoom, I don't have these things. And people are looking down at me, no tengo dinero, and wow, they just didn't have access, but they want to learn. So that's why we all are education avengers, because we stand for equity and we stand for providing everyone with equal access to all educational opportunities. The other thing is that the brain is a pattern seeking device. We're all looking for patterns and associations and connections to create meaning. So what can we do? Well, here's an idea. Neuroplasticity is what we need to look at, but I'm gonna put it in a very simple way. I attended a conference some years ago, a neuroscientist conference where I sat there and as an educator, I go to figure out how can we do this in our classrooms? Because I work with schools around the United States and in the world to help them create mind brain education science environments. Well, this neuroscientist said that neuroplasticity, well, it's very complex, but he had to stand up and he said this, I want you to visualize someone that's struggling to learn something in your classroom. And then he said, repeat after me. So let's repeat his wonderful words together. When someone is struggling to learn something, simply change the energy. And I thought, wow, so we're doing this, change the energy. So in education science, what do we do? We have curriculum instruction models. We have models that have served us well. So let's revisit some of these. And in one case, maybe or two, some of these are new that you can bring to your group. So everyone give me a high five. So here we go, high five, there we are, there we are, good. So whenever someone asks you, do you differentiate instruction? Many times we get really nervous, say, well, I try or it's overwhelming. Well, Dr. Carol Ann Tomlinson gave us the original differentiated instruction model. And she said, there's five things we just need to differentiate. Content, process, products, and here it comes, affect and learning environment. These two here, boy, I can go to town with these. Affect, did you know that emotions are the gatekeeper to learning and attention and application? Wow. So let's revisit Dr. Carol Ann Tomlinson's research on differentiating instruction. But what if you have English language learners? Well, you know what? I'm going to differentiate the content by bringing in, and I'm going to get my prop, some materials that were written for them. So I may have a history textbook, but it's all words, words, words. So I need a textbook that is, you know, written in what's called a comprehensible input format. Do you notice words are connected to images? Get to the point, still the same standards, still the same words, vocabulary, but written in a different format. So I'm gonna differentiate the content and the process as to how I deliver the information. So the next thing is people ask me, why don't our culturally and linguistically diverse kids understand what I'm doing? Well, I'd like to introduce you to my four C's model. And in the four C's, we start out with content, unpacking the standards. Well, yes, but only for us so that we know what we need to do. But the first place is to understand culture, to understand their context, and how does this culture work? What are the yeses and the noes? What are the belief systems? The next thing is to understand the language context your performance context, where do you produce the most language and to learn more about their language and how to make contact with you. Because for this culture, this may be a no, but over here, it works this way. And then finally, the content will just oh, come alive. So I hope we can get together someday to work and go deeply into the four C's. For those of you that have English learners, 
let's look at a different way of describing them. They're actually emerging bilingual students and they come to us with their four Bs. They are bilingual, they are biliterate, they are bicultural. They're trying to figure out and live between two worlds. And did you know there's an area of study in the neurosciences? They're bicognitive. So I look forward to being with you soon, someday, where we can really get into the four Bs and look at how do you teach reading to an English language learner? Is it different? Yes, we would look at biliteracy reading. Yes, 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 so the four Bs. I have some resources for you, so it's time for gifts. So I invite you to come to my website. You can either type in Joe Guzman and put it in the Googler, or you can just go to nhie.net. And on the homepage, I, there's, a tab, there's a button that says additional resources. If you're looking for free materials, free information, you'll go there. When you get to the additional resources page, I want you to scroll down and you'll see something that says Spanish multilingual resources. Tap that, and then you're gonna find all these websites where you will learn everything there is to know about every language on the planet, every culture, teaching materials, and other useful resources. So I hope you go and check it out. So when you're teaching, I created a directed instruction process that I call Chunk and Chew. Did you know the brain has something called brain cycling? It can only process auditory information and visual input for only 11 to 17 minutes, and that's it. So I'm gonna chunk my lesson plan down into 11 to 17 minute chunks. I can only deliver info for 11 to 17 minute chunks. And then after chunk, I'm gonna give them time to chew and process this information. And I have a menu there. Maybe I'm gonna have them journal this time, do some reflection work, maybe some partner work, cooperative learning or whole group instruction. Chunk and chew works perfectly in the virtual classroom and also on site. And whoa, my gosh, it's time to move on. It's time to say goodbye, but we're going to learn some Zulu. We're going to now greet each other because we are Education Avengers and we have a greeting and I think we should always use this one. Did you know that in the Zulu language, the greeting is Sawabuna. I see you, Sakona. I am here. And then the last part, I am what I am because of who we all are. And we are all education Avengers out there. And our purpose is to provide all students with equity and equal access to all education opportunities. And how do we go about our work? Every Avenger has to have their sign, their greeting, their way that they, you know, Thor goes around with his hammer. We go to it with heart, we go to it with hope, and we go to it with faith that everything's gonna work out if we all stay together. Thank you for being with us. And Mark, pass it back to you because I've got my notepad. I'm ready to learn from our true next teachers. Thanks, Joe. That was an awesome program. We really appreciate it. It was fantastic. Next, we have a highly sought after expert on communicating student achievement. His topic is grading and reporting in the virtual classroom. Ken O'Connor. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. And I'd like to thank Mark for providing uh, this opportunity. Uh, I think it's a great way to uh, get all sorts of important ideas out and to uh, introduce us to hopefully lots of people who we may be able to see virtually or in person in the not too distant future. And so my focus of my work is very much on grading and reporting. And so I think obviously now is the time that we have to start thinking about what's it going to look like uh, after the pandemic. Uh, and the first thing I think we have to be really clear about is that this is a crisis uh, and that it's created all sorts of difficulties. Uh, and some of these are gonna be very difficult to overcome. Clearly it's a health crisis, over 110,000 deaths now in the US, over 400,000 deaths worldwide. Uh, the economy is in free fall. Unemployment is at the highest levels that it's been since the Great Depression. There are lots of people who are having trouble with staying at home, with isolation, with social distancing. I mean, some of that has political 
and but it, it whether it's political or not it, it's it's creating huge difficulties and part of that difficulty is because of the uncertainty how long is it going to go on for and and that has led to unrest around uh, the the pandemic but now we also have the protests the systemic racism concerns which of course are huge uh, and so we have this whole combination of things that really has uh, created a, a, a huge crisis and that in education as Joe said uh, part of that crisis was because of the sudden sudden shutdown of the schools and we didn't know for how long was it for the rest of the school year was it into the next year and this put great pressure on teachers both three months ago and now and I think this survey that was reported in ASCD smart brief really summed it up well that the, the rapid transition uh, during the closures affected teachers and students with the majority of teachers saying they're somewhat or extremely uncertain, stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, and lonely. I and mean, it's really important that we consider that context. And it's also put huge student pressure on students uh, then and, and now. And there have, uh, there's obviously been real issues in terms of internet, availability and device access in the, the virtual world. And we don't know how long that is going to continue. Um, how have we generally in education responded to the crisis? Uh, we re responded with online learning, we re responded with packets, we responded with recommended hours for different grade levels, uh, different schools, different school districts did all sorts of things to try and make sure that as many students as possible had internet access. And then I think one of the things that became very clear, and it relates very much to some of the things that Joe said, that we have a really important order of operations in the online learning, that we had to start with connection, with understanding the basic needs of students. And we had to do that before the relationships could be built or renewed. And only after that could we have engagement and concern with the equity. And only after that could we have learning, whether it was uh, digging into what we had done or new learning. And when we were in that learning phase, we had to really focus on feedback and communicating clearly with students and with parents. And, and I think this, hopefully, um, would have always been our order of operations. But this situation has made it very clear that we need this to be our order of operations. One of the very first things that came out in the response was what do we do about grades? And there was much angst about this. And in many places, there was a move to uh, simplify, to say it, all the grades are passed or incomplete. But there are some problems with that. Is the, that the way we should continue? And then there've been issues about how much of what we're doing should be asynchronous or synchronous. It's been especially an issue uh, where I live in Toronto, Canada. And there's also been an explosion of information, of blogs, of webinars, on Facebook learning groups, on Twitter chats, and of online publications. We've been bombarded with uh, information. But I think that, to me, the main things that have come out is that less is more, that we've got to be more focused, that we have to be flexible because of all the different circumstances, that we have to have empathy uh, to recognize different situations, and that above all, we need equity. Uh, so these are things that we have to recognize as the context for anything that we're going to do. Uh, and I think a good way to think about what we're doing and what we're going to do is the stop, start, continue idea, but always with, with purpose in mind. So where are we? Where do we want to go? Um, now, of course, which of stop, start, continue applies depending on where you're already at. Uh, and so my stop, start, continue is based on my perception of the common state. Now, so something that I say stop might be something that you're not doing. So that doesn't apply to you. But in this context of stop, start, continue, I really like the idea of this quote, and I don't know where it came from, but never let a good crisis go to waste. Let's make sure that things are different on the other side. I think we have the potential for a real silver lining uh, coming out of this crisis. And so what are the things we need to continue um, generally, and maybe for some people start? Um, the recognition of the critical role of relationships for engagement, for learning, the critical role of equity, empathy, and flexibility. Uh, 
grace before grades is a phrase that I've heard over and over again, that, you know, grades are not our most important thing. We have to understand our learners and that there is all sorts of opportunities for collaboration. I mean, how many times have we heard words like stronger together? And I think part of it has been the understanding that we need to focus on what's important, that generally we try to do too much. And I think there's also been um, an understanding about the critical role of feedback. But I think a really interesting part of that has been that there's been a recognition that not only do we need to give feedback, but we need to ask for feedback, especially from students. And that we also need to provide opportunities for students to self-assess, reflect and goal setting. This has been very obvious in the virtual learning situation because we don't have them uh, with us uh, in an in-person setting. Um, now the, the equity piece, this is a new one for me. I'm sure many of you have seen the, the baseball example, uh, but this is a new one for me, but I really think it, it showed it very well in, in slightly different ways moving from inequality to equality, to equity, to, to justice. So what should we stop doing? And again, this assumes that they're things that you've been doing. Um, and again, because they're very common practices. I think we stop, have to stop having percentage grades and along with percentages zeros, because clearly in this situation where we, it was difficult to get evidence of student achievement. The idea that we could identify 101 levels was ridiculous. Uh, we need to stop averaging because that's not what learning's about. That it's not about what's the average of all of things. It's really about when we make judgments of student achievement, where are we now? We have to stop any sort of penalties for behaviors in grades, for late submission of assessment evidence of her academic dishonesty made no sense in the uh, virtual learning situation, and it doesn't make sense in whatever we're in. Another one that I've heard a lot and that's been an issue during the uh, online learning is for schools and school districts to require a certain number of marks per week. It's never made sense, but it certainly should, didn't work in virtual learning. It doesn't work when we're in, in brick and mortar schools. So it's something that should be stopped. And another thing I think that's become very clear is that words matter. And one word that really matters is the word work. That it, and that's been particularly clear in this virtual situation. Students aren't working. They're learning, they're doing, they're making, they're demonstrating learning. And I think if we change our language to that, it really changes the whole context of assessment uh, and grading. So what are some things that should be for some people continued for others continued? And that is the first one is identifying very clearly what are our priority, st priority standards. I know lots of school districts have done this, but the pandemic has made this even clearer. And Matt Townsley was the person that I think came up with this idea of pandemic priority standards. What are the standards that have injurious, that are important from a readiness to get students ready for the next level and have leverage? help with transfer, help with the higher order thinking. Um, we need to start, if we're not already doing it, to have grades based on two to seven levels of proficiency, uh, not anything greater than that, because there's, we can't have any real meaning to more than two to seven levels. And we should be focused on standards, not method as assessment. We shouldn't be using points and percentages. And if we use, say, whatever, whatever number of levels we use, it's very important that we can emphasize the idea of learning over time. So the lowest level isn't you're hopeless. I'm obviously being a little facetious, but it's not yet incomplete. Learning is an ongoing process. And that the way to determine grades is to see what is the mode, what is the more recent level of performance, and then apply professional judgment. And please notice that what I said there, grades are determined. Grades should be determined. They shouldn't be calculated. Another thing that we need to, to start doing more of or continue is much greater student voice and choice, student agency, the use of passion projects, of problem-based learning of digital portfolios. And what goes along with that is the emphasis on words, not symbols. What helps us get better is words, not symbols. And I think this connects with the idea 
of a more holistic evaluative view of student achievement, that it, it, we should be looking at the whole picture of student achievement. Primarily, we look at summative assessment evidence, but we need to consider the whole body of evidence. There have been lots of issues where students haven't been engaging and people say, well, it's because we stopped giving grades and because they knew their grade. That should never have been the motivation. The motivation for students shouldn't be their grades. The motivation should be learning. So we need to maximize intrinsic motivation and minimize extrinsic motivation. And in a very specific aspect of assessment, we need to make more use of conversation as assessment evidence. Uh, and I think many teachers have found that in this situation because they haven't been able to get as much of the other type of evidence. You know, we have three basic types of evidence, conversation, observation, and products. They're all really good sources of evidence. We tend, especially at middle school and high school, to emphasize the product evidence, and we should be more emphasizing the conversation evidence. What are some other things that I think we should continue or start? And these are maybe a little bit more radical. Um, up to grade eight, preferably to grade 10, I think we shouldn't have any subject grades. Uh, we should have grades for standards plus narrative communication. There is no real need for a subject grade uh, except for the last two years of high school. And so we should have, I think, GPA for two, two years at the most. The way we currently do GPAs, most commonly for four years, <coughs> excuse me, is gender discrimination against boys because boys are far more likely to be immature jerks in grade nine and 10, but to be solid citizens and good students in grade 11 and grade 12. I think we need, this has suggests shown us clearly that there are issues with the high school transcript. We need to really think about the high school transcript. And especially if you're not familiar with it, I would urge you to look at mastery.org, the uh, transcript that's being proposed by the Mastery Transcript uh, Organization. And I think we've also recognized during this time the issues with competition, uh, that class rank doesn't have much value, and that we should be reconsidering things like honor roll, academic prizes, and valedictorian. And uh, the last one that I want to emphasize is the idea of hard and fast points where we determine grades during the school year, whether we call them quarters, terms, trimesters. This caused lots of problems in terms of how we were going to determine grades. Quarters, terms, trimesters really are only administrative and communication conveniences. Learning goes on over a whole year or over a whole course. Uh, and we need to be, be, be clear about that and make sure that grades aren't carved in stone at the end of a quarter, the end of a term, the end of a trimester. Now, what I've fairly deliberately done in this uh, time that I had available is throw a lot of stuff at you. I've thrown lots of stuff to, at the wall. And I hope that what happens for everyone is that at least two or three of those things are highly relevant to you, that they stick for you. But everything that I've talked about very quickly are things that could and should be discussed probably at great length. And I would love to have the opportunity at some time to in person or virtually extend the conversation on some of these things uh, with lots of educators. Uh, we've also, I think, re recognized or what's been recognized through this is a quote that I really liked. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it's that schools mean the world to their most important stakeholders, the students themselves. I think that one of the silver linings that has come out of this is that there is a much greater appreciation of teachers, both by students and by parents. And I hope that that's something that will continue and that we can make use of uh, because it's really, really important to recognize. And then um, if you felt that you wanted to contact me, I like professional dialogue. Um, here is my email address, my Twitter handle and my uh, website. Uh, and so um, I hope you found some value in this and I'll hand it back to Mark. Thanks, Ken. That was a very interesting, informative, thought-provoking presentation. We all really enjoyed it. Finally, our last education avenger advocates changes 
to transform school cultures using technology and facilitating student learning. His topic is leading in a remote learning, learning world. Eric Scheninger. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to Ken and Joe. A lot, a lot to think about everyone. And the challenge now is, you know, how do I try to wrap that all up and, and, and really look at, you know, not just where we are, but where we want to be. So I'm going to talk about, you know, leading remote learning, but also what comes next. So uh, my name is Eric. I'm an associate partner with the International Center for Leadership and Education. Prior to this, I was a teacher and principal in the state of New Jersey, where we did a lot of transformational work. Uh, back in the mid to late 2000s while increasing achievements. But let's really look at this concept of, you know, where we are now, but more importantly, where we want to be. So as we think about, you know, when sort of the pandemic reached great heights in March, you know, everyone was sort of, you know, very concerned. We were kind of, maybe some cases we were caught with our pants down. But here's the thing, we weren't prepared for this. You know, and you heard both Joe and uh, Ken allude to that. But, you know, what was happening and what's still happening is educators were trying to fly the plane while building it at the same time. But here's what we learned, ladies and gentlemen. We learned that a virus cannot stop your commitment to kids. Teachers and administrators have stepped up. It's not about good or bad. It's about what you did and how the lengths that you went to keep learning going for your kids. So as we think about remote learning and why is it important to sort of, you know, talk about this now since some schools are over and some, or some are wrapping it up because we do not know what protocols will be in place uh, when schools reopen in the fall. I'm already working with school districts across the country on a hybrid plan. You know, what will it look like if social distancing is still in place? Some schools, correction, many schools will still be implementing remote learning. Here's what I do know. There is no one right way, everybody. The right way is your way. Think about what you have done up to this point. What was successful? What wasn't? And think about how you'll develop a plan for consensus as you go forward. You know, when we think about successful remote learning, it's not about pile on, piling on too much work for kids. It's about assigning a, a manageable workload, not putting too much responsibility on parents. Why is that important? Because parents are working from home as well. You know, uh, we heard references uh, to equity uh, that Ken talked about before. We have to ensure equity. And here's what we realized. As we went to remote learning, millions of kids Millions of kids in the United States alone still do not have access to high quality Wi-Fi or internet devices. As educators, you got to determine what's feasible, digital, non-digital, or a blend, avoiding low level worksheets and packets. You know, we don't want to just focus on fill in the blank, multiple choice. We want to challenge our kids to think. I'll talk a little bit later about how we can utilize more uh, personalized, differentiated strategies such as playlists and choice boards. You know, playlists can be differentiated where kids select the order of the tasks that can have different uh, levels of difficulty, but they do all the tasks. With choice boards, kids select from say three of nine activities. And both playlists and choice boards are very popular blended learning strategies. Assigning independent reading with reflective questions. You know, also we have to figure out what tools are best. You probably dabbled with some tools, whether you're a teacher or you're, you saw what was being used in your school. You gotta figure out which ones actually get the most bang for your buck. In this case, everyone, less is more. We have to communicate consistently, excessively with stakeholders. Making time for check-ins. If our kids are still doing remote learning when schools reopen, we have to make sure we're checking in with them. We, you know, uh, we heard before about the whole social emotional learning aspect. That's why those check-ins are so important, even with uh, regular phone calls. If you're an administrator, we gotta be flexible with teachers. And one thing that I could say where there's a lot of room for growth with remote learning is making sure that accommodations for special education students are met. You know, when we think about practices to avoid, and I will tell you that I've reflected a little bit, um, but I'll get to that one point in a minute. We don't want to pile on too much work. We don't want to just to post assignments where there's no mechanisms for feedback. We don't want to just provide digital options because we have to be cognizant of screen time, 
I, for one, my eyes hurt all the time I'm spending in front of the screen. Now, I was anti-grading during remote learning, but I kind of changed my stance on that, and I'll kind of uh, come back to that. And a lot of the points that Ken say, Ken uh, talked about previously, will really resonate with my change of heart. Grading, it has to be fair, it has to be equitable, and it really has to be a culmination of, well, how are kids learning? You know, we don't want to just rely on low-level worksheets, packets, or low-level teachers pay teachers materials. I'm not against teachers pay teachers materials, but we have to vet them, ladies and gentlemen. We have to make sure that they're actually challenging kids to think. We don't want to think that we have to abide by a traditional school day schedule. We don't want to force teachers to follow a traditional school day uh, schedule or working remotely. That's not how it works. When we're using video tools, like here, we're using Zoom. You got to be 13 or older, everyone. If kids are using Zoom and they're younger than 13, that's a violation of FERPA and COPA. So we don't also want to post pictures and videos of kids learning online if we don't have consent. Always err on the side of caution. And also, you know, we heard the reference to priority standards. Don't think you have to cover the entire curriculum and every standard. So as we think about where we are now, but where we want to be, we want to make sure that with remote learning and any type of hybrid model or even face-to-face, -face, when we go back to it in our schools, does two things, everyone. It's empowering kids to think the uh, vertical axis, but also how are kids applying their thinking? You know, the doing the same old thing, a one size fits all approach, not getting kids to actually create, communicate, collaborate. You know, the idea here is not to prepare kids for something. How do we prepare kids for anything? And you do that by moving from quad A to C to B and to eventually D. And as we think about what we want, you know, and I saw some reference in the chat box here, you know, many kids don't have technology. Here in my district, we have kids that are 95% poverty. We have some kids that are only 5% poverty. So we had to go with a blended approach during our remote learning. And um, there's great ways we can still do effective remote learning without tech. You know, we might model through video or we do it through, you know, we do a direct instruction lesson. Well, here we have to write out the explanations, scaffolded questions and tasks, providing guided independent practice, authentic uh, challenge problems for kids to solve, independent reading, reflective questions, playlists, choice boards, get kids up and moving. And I loved how Joe had you guys get up and move. I hope you did that. And using reflective writing journals. Coming back to where the technology falls, why did I show you that image of the rigor relevance framework? Because ladies and gentlemen, it's not technology on one side, curriculum, instruction, and assessment on the other. It's about learning. And whether we're in a remote world or face-to-face, -face, we want to make sure that the technology is actually leading to a fundamental improvement in what we do. How are your kids learning with technology in ways that they couldn't without it? How does it allow you to do what you do better? And this was an image that, you know, I actually created once I came on board with the International Center, you know, taking those tenets, those core tenets of learning, thinking, application, and understanding that technology is just one tool, one resource. But what we've learned in a blended world is, you know, blended learning has really become the foundational pedagogical strategy. Blended instruction is what the teacher does with tech. Blended learning is where kids use technology to control path, pace, and place. There is a difference. But in a, uh, a remote world, these are the four main components. Synchronous instruction, using Zoom, Google Hangouts, Blue Jeans. Asynchronous work, where kids are engaged in a playlist, a choice board, or they're working on a project. But what we really need to focus on in the remote world is those collaborative experiences. How are we using technology to get kids that working at a distance to work together. And also the use of adaptive learning tools to differentiate, to provide us with data that can inform instruction and provide more support for those kids that need it the most. As I alluded to before with you know, remote learning and leading remote learning, we cannot forget about our kids with disabilities. Now, I just have some verbiage here that's basically copy and pasted from the US Department of Education. And what I did was kind of summarize it at the bottom. If your district or school has any sort of remote learning going on during a school closure for your regular ed kids, 
you have to provide accommodations for those that have IEPs in order to meet IDEA. So that's point number one. Point number two, when we think about meeting uh, the special needs of our kids, is you know changing the IEPs. If IEP teams can meet physically, all right, change them. But if not, use uh, Zoom, use Google Hangouts. But if you're using those video tools, make sure you have protocols in place to safeguard sensitive information. So summary before I kind of do my big wrap up, which I don't know if will be so big, that's up for you to decide. As you're leading remote learning, you know, think about your role. Are you a teacher leader, building leader, district leader? Be flexible. Lead through an empathetic lens. Learn what others are doing. That is your greatest resource. Don't reinvent the wheel. Implement realistic and fair grading that makes sense. And I'll just defer and say everything that Ken said before, do that. Connect with your families. Provide professional learning support. This, hey, teachers and administrators were not provided professional learning support during this crisis. We need to get it right. We can still use CARES money for another couple of weeks, but you've got to build it into your long-term plans. Make sure students are safe online and make sure your teachers, your community, make sure that and kids are exhibiting self-care. You know, we've seen COVID, we've seen the role of social media. We've also seen that not only with remote learning, kids, families are online more and more. So when you think about being safe, these are just some tips, everyone. If you're a parent, you're giving advice to your parents, grandparent, utilize strong passwords, use a VPN uh, and antivirus protection for all devices, regularly update your software, upgrade the security of your home network, always back up files offline, online, manage social media profiles, get the passwords of your kids if you're a parent, tell your parents to. Check your security and privacy settings, never open up suspicious emails or attachments, and do not friend anyone you don't know. Why is this important? Because as we continue with remote learning, we have to keep our kids safe. And I'm gonna end with, where do you go from here, everybody? Maslow's before blooms, you've probably heard that a lot. We've heard all of the, the surveys of how some teachers aren't, aren't gonna be comfortable coming back to school. Parents aren't comfortable sending their kids back to school. This is why, first and foremost, we have to work on planning now to make sure our schools are safe. Engage with your stakeholders, get their input. Make sure you're actually listening. Prioritize. As you engage and listen, think about what has to be done first. Come to a consensus. And you know what? All means all. When we think about health and safety, students, teachers, administrators, secretaries, bus drivers, grounds crew, cafeteria workers, we have to ensure the safety of all. And taking everything that you've heard, from my fellow Avengers today, and the ones that you've heard previously, you need to focus on what your re-entry plan is going to encompass. And this is not in an order, everybody. It's not one is the most important, but we have to focus on SEL. We have to make sure that we're addressed and close those learning gaps for some of our kids when they come. We have to make sure we're implementing pedagogically sound blended learning, ensuring equity, planning now for flexible, innovative sketch schedules for social distancing, looking at the budget. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We're going to have a budget crisis, everyone. We have to make sure that the money that we have is being spent on what we need. Look at those other items, but also think about how you're going to provide the professional learning support for your teachers, for your administrators, for your community. I can't count how many virtual professional development sessions I've done for parents during this crisis. And throughout the process, think about how you're going to engage the community. All in all, everyone, it comes down to relationships. Without trust, there's no relationship. Without relationships, no real learning occurs. Always focus on that most important R. Yes, we want learning to be rigorous. We want it to be relevant, but without relationships in place, it doesn't really matter. So this is my last slide. And I will tell you that, um, you know, as we think about where we are now, and you think about your role, leadership is not about position, title, or power. Leadership is about action. And I never realized how <laughs> prominent and important this book was going to be when I did the new edition of Digital Leadership just two years ago. Uh, I should, sorry, a year ago. And I've been getting so much feedback from educators across the country and the world about how this is helping them get through this. Think about student learning 
not just engagement, learning. What does it look like? What do you want it to look like? How can you improve? How will you improve your physical learning spaces, but also your virtual learning spaces? How will you empower your educators to engage in meaningful professional learning that's job embedded and ongoing? How you communicate your successes and your challenges? How you take control and tell your story? You know, not just in our classroom with our kids, but to your greater community. What do you want your brand presence to be? You know, what messages you want out there? And finally, if we can't harness the inherent opportunity, yes, this has been a challenging time. It's been a challenging time with COVID. It's been a challenging time as we're battling with racism, but there is opportunity to get better, everybody. There's me on Twitter. Again, my name's Eric Scheninger. Um, you can get more information uh, from me through AEI. There's my website if you want to learn about, more about the work. But right now, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Mark. Thanks, Eric. That was a great presentation. The slides were uh, fantastic. Everybody was uh, enjoying that quite a bit. And to everybody out there, thank you very much for uh, coming to our event. Our next program is going to be on July 9th. And uh, please contact the agency if you're interested in having one of our Avengers uh, do an in-person or a virtual event in your school district. So thanks again for showing up, and we'll see you in July.